So, hello. I should like turn you guys around so you can all see all of your like, no, I won't do that. All of your Zoom friends. Um, my name is Josh Farr. I'm the director here at the Vermont Center for Photography. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we are so glad to have Joan here in my, my butt is making Zoom noises. <laughs> Hang on. It's, it's a weird echo of myself. Do I have Zoom on that? Oh, I do. Hang on. Unmute. Oh, I don't know. We're just going to roll with it. So, like I was saying, thank you guys for coming um, on this unseasonably mild November day. Can we just think about that for a second? Um, this, as many of you may know, is the brand new VCP space that we just are in the process of settling into this fall, opened in September from our 22 years down Flat Street. And we're super thrilled with how it came out and to have the thrift store and the galleries, flexible gallery space, the secondary gallery space, the library, which is behind this movable wall and the digital lab and the dark room and all of the things that we, such as tonight that we try to put on um, and I should say, we're also trying to run a Photoshop class at the same time. So we're really juggling three things at once. Tonight. But, um, so we're just thrilled that we're able to put this on and that you guys are all here to support this. And for those of you that supported the renovation and the move in this whole project, we are forever indebted to all of you. So, um, I just want to say a quick thing about Joan. Um, many of you most likely know Miss Lovely Joan. But Joan um, is an artist and educator. She received her MFA in photography um, from the University of New Mexico in 1998. And since moving to Vermont in 2004, she's taught at Marlboro College, Keene State College, and currently teaches photography at Greenfield Community College. Um, she served as the chair of the board of Vermont Center for Photography, lovely place. Um, currently her exhibit titled The Scarf, no. not currently, Formerly, about three years ago, her exhibit um, titled The Scarf, um, funded in part by a grant from the Vermont Community Foundation's Vermont Arts Endowment Fund, um, was installed at the Brattleboro Museum and Arts Center. Um, and her recent work has been shown throughout New England, including the Drury Gallery in Marlboro, um, the Spheris Gallery in Hanover, New Hampshire, and the Thorn Sagendorf in Keene, um, as well as the Vermont Center of Photography. Um, along with teaching full time at GCC, Joan is active in facilitating groups um, that meet with residents at the Greenfield Jail. Um, she has taught GCC classes in photography at the jail since 2014 and is working on the fourth annual exhibit of photography, poetry, and artwork produced in those groups. Um, so, Joan is here to talk a bit about photography, the meaning of photography. Why do we do it? What does it all mean? And if there's anybody more well-versed to handle such a daunting question, it's our lovely friend, Joan Beer. So thank you, Joan. Josh, thank you, Josh. Um, so folks, I am gonna take my mask off because as I get nervous, I breathe real and I can't see. So, uh, but I am vaccinated and also, you know, and I, I, I'm, I live in this. So, uh, thank you. Uh, one thing I do want to say uh, about what, what Josh said, it was from an older uh, uh, blurb that I'm not sure where it was from, but I, I am not currently putting a show together of uh, artwork from the jail, uh, but I intend to. Uh, I also, I, I haven't taught at the jail for about three years. I still run the group. I go there all the time, but between, you know, a breast, breast cancer and the pandemic, I haven't, you know, we haven't had a summer class there. Um, uh, Christina, you were one of my assistants. You were part of that, that whole thing. And so, you know, that the power of that, I'll be teaching a summer class in the women's unit this time around. So that should be uh, a, a good class. But let's get to the talk on seeing. And I, I want to preface the talk by saying 
one how crazy this topic is. <laughs> um, over the summer, uh, Chris Trebert invited me to come to some of the board meetings. Um, there was a lot happening, the transition from the old space to this space, and everyone was excited. Um, I think Chris might have been hoping I would join the board, <laughs> and um, I did not, but I attended a few meetings. Yeah. And um, uh, in, in the excitement, everyone is planning stuff and what they're going to do and teaching workshops. And so I'm there and in the excitement of it, I said, well, I'll do a talk. And Chris is like, great, you know, and uh, what are you going to do a talk on? And of course, I had not thought of this at all. And I just heard myself blurt out on scene. And then when I left, <laughs> when I left, I thought, what the WTF? I don't know what I'm, I don't know what to say about seeing. Uh, although I do, uh, obviously, as a teacher, I talk about seeing photography. I talk about seeing in order to take pictures. So that's a topic that I talk about all the time. But I feel like, um, I, I, I thought doing a talk, I was supposed to codify it somehow and give you some lessons. I really, then I thought, no, I'm off the clock right now. If it's for me, tell them I'm busy. So I'm not gonna teach you anything. I'm just gonna talk about photographs. I'm gonna talk about the approaches that I use to enter pho photographs. Um, uh, because sometimes photographs are inscrutable. We look at them and they're just mute. They could be anything if we decided so. So anyway, this is what I uh, am uh, doing. Uh, so th there, of course, there are two ways of, of taking, of seeing. One is all of you who take pictures. Um, you're out seeing all the time. Some people get really good at seeing. Now I had intended, and Bob, I, I did not, but I had intended to show some of Bob uh, George's work because of all of the local photographers, Bob George has eyes and he sees things that I don't see. And it's because he practices. He walks around Brattleboro and he sees things he logs them into his, his memory and he goes back some time to do it when the light is right or when the weather is right. And I've always been in awe, Bob, of your ability to see. And, and um, uh, But then the second part of it is when we look at Bob's photographs or any photographs, that's the other part of seeing. It's the, you know, Bob doesn't take these pictures just to put them away, although I'm sure you have a storage room full of your photographs. But um, so anyway, um, as I was as I was thinking about what to talk about, uh, I, I was thinking about how we read photographs, how we pick them apart, and it occurred to me that the old episodes. There were a couple of old episodes of the Twilight Zone that for me <laughs> reminded me of how we poke around at photographs. And the theme was time standing still because as photographers, that's kind of what we do. We take pictures, that moment gets captured, the moment, the light, uh, the shadow all gets captured and frozen. And then we get to look at it. We get to, you know, like I said, poke around. So I am, I'm going to show you this. I, I'm hoping the audio is set up for this, but uh, let's see. Is it? Okay. Maybe you don't want it that high, but so this one doesn't have a lot of audio, but um, let's go. Okay. But this is how I feel about what we do. And you could turn it down. This is really not interesting music. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So in this uh, this scene, astronauts 
from the future come down to earth and find that everything is frozen. And they walk around in their crazy outfits and all these people are just frozen and they get to walk around. They look at people's expressions. Uh, of course, the camera takes us around here too, but this is kind of what we, we do. We look at these frozen images. Now, uh, as if this wasn't enough, I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll go to this next one uh, because there was another clip that I kind of liked. Um, because in this clip, and here you could put the, the, the audio up just a little bit because it's not that it's that interesting. Never mind. Bring up, Al. Now, thank you for your generosity. I have something for you. It's a stopwatch, an old family heir. Oh, what do you do with it? I mean, it doesn't keep time. It's just a stopwatch. That is a fact. Whether this is yours. <laughs> Wait. It works. I push the button, I stop the watch, and I stop the world. I told you, all you guys, I have something to show you. Pay attention. With this little gizmo, I can stop trains, tanks, subways, anything, as of tomorrow evening. But Nulti is going to be loaded. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Ah, I'll have it fixed. Oh, please, come on, wake up. Oh, you, Mr. Please, say something. I'm sorry, I took the money. I took the money. It wasn't oh, great. <laughs> hear people say something again, and to see people moving again. Oh, doesn't anybody know how to make this thing work again? Someone, help! Help me! Please, somebody, move! <laughs> All right, all right, all right. You get the idea. Uh, but I love this because while, yes, I say that we can poke around uh, and, and look at photographs uh, forever, and what happens when that stopwatch, when we become part of that, that stopwatch is the camera, right? Uh, anyway, uh, it's silly, um, but I think, it has something to do with what I'm talking about. Uh, so when we look at photographs, just like the, the uh, spacemen coming down, they take an inventory of what they see. And that's what we do when we look at photographs. We look at the contrast. We look at line. We look at shape. And we look at what the objects are in it and try to make some sense out of why they are all configured in that one moment of time, because that's certainly what we do. Now, this next slide, I'm actually going to ask folks, my former students have all seen this slide. Um, but so, so you can certainly uh, jump in there and start this discussion on describing a photograph, because in order to get at a photograph, it's important to be able to describe what we see. Uh, there is an exercise that uh, the photographer Robert Heineken used to do at, that, that he would have written assignments where people would simply describe what they see uh, in, in one essay, and then they would get into the meaning or the content of it in another essay. So basically splitting it all apart. And I do something like that. And the first image is this. Now, I would like to know basically what are we looking at and, and not interpret it at all. Just basically what is there? What do we see here? Can I see it all? A supermarket? Bread. Bread. And and and, and I heard lines and shapes and value. Lines, shapes, and value. Yep, yep, yep. Some of the things that we kind of forget to describe when we're looking at an image is that this is a black and white, real basic. But we look at it and we just see the photograph, you know, uh, but it is in black and white. What's the format? Paper. 
Yeah, so as photographers, and many of you are photographers, most of you, um, you know that this was shot with a medium format camera. So we have a lot of information already about this photograph. Um, it is bread. What kind of bread? Processed bread. Yeah, exactly. Processed bread. And as you said, it's in a supermarket. And more specifically, it's one aisle of the supermarket. It's, uh, uh, and, and so there's probably lots more that we could talk about. We could talk about like lines. We could talk about the way they stack the bread. Some people stack their wood that way, you know, sideways. And I, oh, I don't stack wood, but I know that some people do uh, are very careful about how they also make their the wood. Talk about the flatter and lighting. Yeah, exactly. Unflattering lighting, and you know that's the way supermarkets are, right? That mm -hmm. that awful um, uh, fluorescence that just flattens everything out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, also, the parking for the entire day is like some some things like talk about like the full package being full range and the black the white pieces on top of that. Yes, yes. So it's kind of kind of flat, except for maybe this line yeah. here. You're right. It's kind of a flat image, and um, and that kind of goes with the idea of this kind of bread in this kind of supermarket, this kind of uh, place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we started, you know, describing this, and we're already into interpreting it. We're interpreting something about the processed bread. And maybe we make value judgments, but we know a little bit more than just it's a supermarket bread aisle. It's, it's, it's processed, it's, it's plastic. So, all right. I am going to refer every now and then I might refer to uh, this book that I've been, I, I've assigned to my history of photography classes, um, Terry Barrett's Criticizing Photographs. And there is a chapter in there on simply describing and, and the importance of describing. And so that's why I start with this. Now, I want to admit something to my students too here. Uh, for years, I thought this photograph was made by Robert Adams, the um, uh, landscape photographer from the new topographics, uh, if anyone knows who that is. And, it's not. <laughs> it's something I found and it happened to be on a page with Robert Adams. And I was like, yeah, sure, I'll take that. But that's okay because it still makes sense when you see the next image by Robert Adams. <clears throat> what are we looking at here? Of course, it says it right there. Huh? The line shape value. Suburbia. Yes. Suburbia. Yeah. Yeah. America. Yeah. Yeah. Colorado. Yeah. Cookie cutters. Cookie cutters. Yeah. Like you remember that song, Little Boxes on the Hillside? Yeah. 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 Uh huh. Because they do all look just the same. Do they remind you of the bread aisle at all? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the, the bread is covered in plastic. These are covered in whatever kinds of plastics they use to build these houses, these, these developments. And, and of course, this is in 1973. Uh, there was a lot of housing development going on out west. Where, you know, this is Colorado, but that was going on in uh, New Mexico. Um, and, and all the Western states because, well, a lot of people from the East Coast were moving out to the, these suburbs and it was uh, a cheaper living. Um, but that goes hand in hand with the bread. The bread is cheaper to buy when it's wrapped in plastic and mass produced, not when it's this nice crusty bread that you get from your local bakery. Um, so. So anyway, I, I, I put these together because another way of looking at images is to sort of compare them, compare an image with something else. 
and it starts illuminating that image. Yeah, yeah. Is it possible to say something else in here? No, we all, our minds are so much not too much. I don't think it's possible to say anything else in here. Especially when I put them together. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, and, and I would hope that's what I hope that we could do. And that's what I do by putting these two together. Yeah. Uh, people online were just saying that it's hard to hear you when you walk too far away from the computer. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to stay tethered to one place um, I, because I'm constantly, you know, pointing. Uh, and I do have a pointer, but you know, I'd rather, I'd rather walk around, but anyway, I'll try to stay put. Thank you. Uh, anyway, so, so this, this uh, new topographics that I had mentioned in case you had never heard of it, it was a uh, group of photographers whose work was in an exhibit called the new topographics. Uh, these included uh, Robert Adams, Lewis Baltz, uh, Bernd and Hilla Becker, Joe Deal, Frank Golke, uh, Nicholas Nixon, John Schott, Stephen Shore, and Henry Wessel Jr. Um, the show made a big splash. Uh, there, the, the, the catalog for the show was printed over and over again. It's still in print, I believe. And basically what, what the curator of the show was trying to get at is that is the human interaction with the landscape. Now, in 1973, people, these people who were photographing were uh, of the era of um, Ansel Adams, let's say, right? Ansel Adams and the glorious, dramatic landscapes of the American West. Um, they were pristine. They were beautiful. Even if the landscape itself wasn't pristine, Ansel Adams never photo photographed the garbage that was right behind or the beer bottle or whatever. Um, but these people are talking about something different. It's the same landscapes, but it, there is this human intervention that is going on. And it's read, maybe it's a little bit more cynical view of the landscape than Ansel Adams. Uh, so, and it's just because they're looking at it, they're seeing it, and maybe other people weren't seeing it. This is like something that um, um, worthy of seeing. Anyway, uh, like I said earlier, this is a kind of stream of consciousness because when I put these slides together, I think, ooh. We got to see this one too. Oh, we got to see this next one. So, so this is another Robert Adams, and you can see uh, that the this is soon to be a neighborhood. We already have the street signs um, and the framework up for these, you know, little houses that look all alike. And then, you know, now after seeing a few of Robert Adams's, this one, if you ask me starts to look a little bit depressing. And now maybe I shouldn't have put that idea in your head, but why does anyone else see that? Yeah. What's depressing about it? What do you, what, what's making it look depressing? A bird in a cage, isolation? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And we know what this used to be. This is not natural to the um, uh, Western landscape, right? That sod, perfectly manicured sod, that's not natural for out there. And naturally, that's why they're in such bad shape right now, because they've been watering too many of these fake lawns and changing the whole, um, uh, changing the climate out there. So, uh, so another, okay, okay. I, I, I take you through these because starting out with the bread aisle and now we're here, we're actually seeing more and more and more in these photographs and we're having an appreciation of it based on the body of work that Robert Adams 
created. Of course, there's a whole lot more than this, but um, but just to push this further, Joe Deal was another one of the photographers in this exhibit, and uh, his the two images I'm going to show you of his are taken from up uh, a little bit higher. This is Untitled View in Albuquerque. And just, just for the sake of conversation, what do you see here? What's going on? It's different than Robert Adams. Aerial, yep, yep. What is it depicting? Two very different kinds of houses in it. There's one that's very traditional, the other one's, I mean, one looks like it's a um, pueblo kind of thing, like a rock and native kind of. The other one looks like it's a building. Yeah, yeah. Any outstanding features? I know that fence is is really you know is it keeping nature out or is it keeping the people in or you know what is going on with this they know exactly where their border is right right so we live here and nature is out there yeah 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 although <laughs> i i i used to i used to live in albuquerque and and you know in in 72 it might have had all that space around it but you know there is another property here now and there and there and there uh, but there is this constant in an image like this i think about how humans encroach on the landscape and keep out nature it's like, all right, I'm here now. You guys all go away. All of the, the wildlife and whatever. You can stay on the other side of the fence. I don't care. Just don't come by, you know, by me. That's kind of this attitude that we have as uh, people who encroach on the landscape. Another Joe deal. Um, I find this hilarious, although sad also uh we saw the the fake the kind of sod uh, uh installed in uh, robert adams's image uh, of that depressing house with this person inside who appeared to be trapped but here's another instance of nature on one side and well and this weird fake grass uh, it's it's uh, pretty to me. It's pretty remarkable, and I um, uh, and it's also sad. We all know we're in a climate crisis, and I'm talking about this stuff that was photographed in the '70s. Um, and this is kind of this is our mentality. This is the mentality that got us here. Um, so I'm going to kind of come back up to the present now and um, another more aerial view, but it's the same idea. And this is by Ed Bertinsky. And I, I think maybe some of you know who's, who's, who that is. Uh, but Ed Bertinsky does these huge photographs. They, they're printed bigger than, than what you see projected here. Um, um, a lot of them are aerial, but uh, they're all environmental. He makes these amazing, um, uh, they're, they're kind of landscapes of things like the um, Alberta tar sands. And the colors are amazing. In fact, his images are beautiful of these horrific, horrific uh, super fun sites. I don't even know if they're, they're active sites, actually. But, um, so this is this is Ed Bertinsky, and we have that same idea, the fence. The, the houses are the same, the fence to stave off nature, and the bulldozers to get ready for your neighbors. Uh, but I think what's even more remarkable is the next one. And when I first saw this, I thought, did he put this together? And no, it's like such a dramatic um, 
two-part image of Navajo Reservation on the left and uh, Phoenix suburb on the right. The Phoenix suburb, look at all that greenery. The greenery, of course, doesn't belong there. It's not native to, to that. Now, another part of accessing photographs is comparing and contrasting. You, you probably remember maybe in your English classes, that's a big strategy for trying to uh, understand what you're writing about is to compare and contrast. And it works in photography too, it works in any art. Is, uh, and so by putting these two very different images in one photograph, because that's the way it was, we can't help but compare and contrast. They look like two different photographs, but they're not. Um, and so the comparisons are, uh, of course, the, the Wilds uh, Navajo Reservation, the line, the road in between and, and all of this. It's kind of remarkable. And I didn't know things like that existed until I saw Ed Bertinsky's work. So by this comparing and contrasting, you notice how we're kind of a little bit outraged at the way we house people uh, and, and our, our philosophy in, in uh, living. Uh, I can't even imagine living in these homes. They probably think we have a great view. It's nothing's back there, yeah. Uh, so comparing and contrasting, that's what I was trying to do with these two images. And of course, when you put them together, which I did, they don't belong together, but I put them together because I really think that um, they go together, uh, not only in the tonal range, but in the repetition of shapes. The, the look at the skyline up here, it's just as light as the the top part of the supermarket. And as a matter of fact, the bottom has a line here and a line here. So there's, there's, there are things that seem to just go. And that's why I put these images together. And that's why I uh, talk about them in class. I'm, I'm going to do just a little bit more of the landscape. Um, this is uh, another, a uh, Robert Adams. Uh, the quarried mesa top in Pueblo County, Colorado. This is in uh, 78. Um, and, and naturally, the first thing we see are the tire tracks, right? We, you know, those, those are, uh, uh, you know, scarring the landscape. And I thought, well, since I'm interested in compare and contrast, I thought, well, I know that there is a Timothy O'Sullivan that will go well with this. And so uh, I put this one right after Robert Adams. Starting to have a conversation and in accessing a photograph, going to the past is another way of comparing and contrasting and making sense of what's happening in the future. Even though Timothy O'Sullivan was not talking about um, uh, any environmental concerns. He just had his, his uh, dark room on the wagon and he, he was just doing his job with, um, he was working for uh, surveyors and, and uh, uh, companies that were going out building the railroads and other things. He was, he was uh, documenting the West, but I can't help but put these together because I feel like there's so much, this is like poetry when you put two words together and they suddenly make sparks. Uh, that's what I'm kind of finding with this. There are tire tracks, actually wagon wheel tracks, but there are tracks in this. It's a very different kind of track. We might even think thoughts like before and after, um, but it's, it's like, it, Still going on. Yeah. Yes. 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 
And you know, when I teach the history of photography, I always talk about, you know, it coincides with the beginning of the industrial revolution, or it maybe comes a little later than, than when that started. And that photography, of course, is part of climate change. It was, it was all in process and it was going, but, but didn't make me put my camera down <laughs> or my processes. So, all right, I'm going to switch topics and uh, from environmental, but still uh, I, I'm talking about how we look at photographs. Now, this next photographer, I found this work in, um, at, in the New York Times. Uh, Fred Ramos. I don't know if anyone saw that. Did anyone see this in the Times? Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you, what are we looking at? Clothing. Yeah. Okay. What kind of clothing? Let's ask yourself some more questions. Used, uh huh, worn. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So we, we there's a religious icon here. There's kind of used clothing. Um, they appear to be just spread out. And going back to one of my earlier comments that photography is mute, right? This is not giving up its secrets right now. Um, we could speculate. I read the article, so I know what it's about, but we can speculate. Why would we see old clothing? Why would we see this, this together? Uh, these are two separate photographs. I just put them together. Um, and I, it, here's another two. They're separate photographs. Um, can you, any, anything more now that you saw the other two? What about these two? The staining is a bit haunting in the sense of it evoking some sense of crime scene. Good. Oh, no, it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's like right, they show the skirt and talk and pull all of that sweatshirt to see the end. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I mean, I see that now that you said it. I didn't see it originally. Yeah. Yeah, good, good, good. You're so you're reading right into this. Um, uh, this is these were made by Fred Ramos, who is a photographer based in Mexico City. Um, he followed mothers or family members on their searches at, who were looking for their missing children. Uh, and uh, you've probably heard that in the news. And <clears throat> so he went they, and, and helped them. He was part of this process. And when the police would find, or the army would find any evidence uh, of these people who passed, these, these children who passed, um, they would take it and put it in the crime lab. So the forensics teams all had these. Uh, Fred Ramos tried to get access to them. And in most cases, they said, no, 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 because they're, they are crime scenes. Uh, they're all packed up and in, in sealed in plastic, but they're crime scenes. But the um, uh, Chihuahuan uh, labs here, you know what I have actually, um, Come on. Well. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, okay. So, so in Chihuahua, they did let him in and they said they were interested in his project. So he was able to lay these clothes out and photograph them. And partly in order to help the families. Um, so, on, this adds to our understanding of the photograph. So sometimes when we're trying to understand a photograph, we need some background information. And that history is a good thing. Now, 
Um, you probably have all heard people say, well, why can't the photograph just speak for itself? And often the photographer needs to help speak for the photograph. They need to enlighten us because this is more than just a crime scene. Now we know that there are uh, uh, you know, thousands of people who had disappeared in, in Mexico. Um, so the process is another important part of how we understand what we're looking at. And along with the process, I think it's fascinating to see the actual process, how this photographer went in. Now, um, because these were crime scenes, he had to wear a whole body suit, uh, you know, like a hazmat suit, so his, his germs would not get in, infected with any of that. Um, gloves, of course, they, everything was sealed up and he needed help from the forensics team. But like I said, they were happy to do it. He just laid these things out and photographed them. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. And now when you see these images, it, I, I feel so much more enlightened after reading the article and I have another appreciation for it. Um, certainly. As photographers, we know that craft is important, right? And yet there are times when craft is not important. This was, these were shot nicely, but they are really deadpan images. It's not about making a gorgeous image. You could put it on your wall, but it's pretty heavy uh, if, if you were to, to buy it. Yeah. All right, so, so process. Now, I am gonna make another leap that has nothing to do with, with anything we've been talking about. And that is um, fashion. And Richard Avedon. <laughs> so we, you, you've probably all seen Richard Avedon's work, right? Or, or, or maybe not, but I'll, I'm gonna show you some. Uh, so Avedon started as a fashion photographer. Now, style is another way to enter a photograph. What is the style that the photographer uh, employs? Okay, uh, um, Avedon was very specific. You could see an Avedon and say, yeah, that's an Avedon because of his style. Now, he was very out there. He was very hip, when, especially when he was young. He would, even when he was old, he was very hip and progressive, kind of misogynist too, but that's, you know, the way everybody was back then. Uh, but <laughs> um, so anyhow, this is his fashion work. Uh, he was also known for his portrait work. He did uh, he, uh, amazing portraits. He had that big camera, he had a bunch of cameras, but he always photographed with a large format camera, um, often um, uh, eight by 10. Uh, and he had this way of taking these portraits. This is, um, this is uh, George and his wife, who was the American, what is it, was it George? Yeah, oh, okay, okay. Anyway, there's this look, if you know anything about him, that he was supposed to be king and did not make it or, or was not king for very long. And I think embittered for the rest of his life, uh, and, but also quite in love with his wife. And uh, so that I guess that made it uh, all worthwhile, but there he is and he's, it, it, I, I think, Anyway, I don't know why I'm talking about that because it has nothing to do with reading photographs, uh, but I do like to read into these photographs. So we go from here stylistically. Um, in, in all the examples that I showed you, we're talking about a white seamless backdrop, right? So he isolates his models. Fashion photographers do that all the time. Okay, that's, of course, when you see the white seamless, you know, <clears throat> that's could be a fashion photograph or it's in a studio. So we make the leap from um, fashion to the American West. And um, 
maybe you have seen images from the American West where Avedon and his group went out West and photographed people uh, coming out of work at the mines, the coal mines, the slaughterhouses. He would go to the state fairs. He would go to uh, prisons and he would get access to people that were not models and he would photograph them. But take a look at the style. What's similar about the style? The white seamless, yeah, yeah. Um, now, you, it, it, anyone who took my history of photography class, you might remember Terry Barrett's describing photographs, uh, and he talks about Avedon a lot in that chapter. Um, and, but he mostly talks about uh, reviewers and how different reviewers saw this work. Uh, and of course it got a lot of rave reviews, but it got a lot of, eh, you know, we're not so sure about this. Um, now, this is one of the rare uh, three-part panels. Most of them are just one photograph like this. Okay, uh, actually, no, this is a two-part panel. This is one photograph, one, most of them are like that. Uh, got all of their names. Uh, Patricia Wild, Jesus, uh, uh, I can't read that because it's um, small or it's pixelated. Anyway, so how do you make that leap from, from stylistically, from going from fashion to this? Or do you see it's not a leap? Anyone have thoughts about it? Yeah. Well, if the same thing, and in some ways the same thing, but from a different kind of you do the same thing if you did exactly just putting it somewhere else. So it's the same thing. I also noticed that, like, if I didn't want to back up in the triplets of that district, I'm sure to see that that was a good thing before my friend said this was a self too. Mm, let me go back to that one because I, I do really like it. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Uh, you can see the um, uh, eight by 10 frame from the, uh, uh, the negative holder, right? Do you see the black lines? That's what those are. And of course that can tell you what kind of film he's using too. Hmm, hmm. I, I it is a white backdrop, but there's two lines that divide in the back. So that kind of right. I think, I think that's part of the image. Yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And and the thing is in this one too, he put these together. Yeah. And obviously, when we look at these two, he's asking us to compare and contrast. What's how do you compare and contrast these two? What yeah, yeah. So I noticed that there's a line down the middle for the cap and the guy that's using arm. Okay. So lying down the middle, that just happens to be the frame, but yeah, uh, putting, but yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So one guy is missing an arm. That's, that's a difference. Absolutely. What else? The chest tattoos. They both have the Jesus chest tattoos. Yes. Yes. They both have abdominal scars. What do you think those scars might be from? These are prisoners in Boxar County, uh, San Antonio, Texas. So just to give you a heads up about who they are, and that's also why they're dressed alike. They look very ethnically similar. And they are uh, Manuel, Eridodia and uh, Jesus Kermonic. I, I can't really read the last, but yes, they both appear to be Latino. Yeah. So this is kind of extraordinary to take two people who have the same kinds of scars, the same kinds of tattoos, 
wearing the same clothes, of course, because they're incarcerated, um, both with hair about the similar length, uh, both with scarring on their face, one has no arm. And so this compare and contrast is trying to say, this is kind of a human condition in this jail, this rough life that perhaps these people lived where they, they um, might get stabbed in the, in the stomach. Uh, they could be surgery scars, but I also wonder if it's just from the, the rough life that they've lived. Well, maybe he was channeling Diana Arbus's picture of the two little twin girls. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, it's just as bizarre. I, I mean, uh, Diane Arvises, of course, are quieter and yet startling in their in their creepiness. Um, but but I think the the idea that he he treats both of these similarly is one of the criticisms. And when I say that. Um, this is a fashion image uh, by Avedon, and this is uh, Juan Patricio Lobato, who's a carny at Rocky Ford, Colorado. And so the pose, look at how that pose, the body language kind of seems very similar, both like this, both turning over this way. So some of the criticism of Avedon's work is that he avidonizes everything. He, he turns everything into an avidon. In fact, it's more about avidon than it is about the American West. I don't know, did he say that? So he said that about himself, but also after this first major exhibit, that's what the, uh, um, uh, cri critics were saying um, that. I don't see that kind of humanizing the people that are pictured by society. So you dehumanizing? So dehumanizing the people who society generally does not look at. Mm, yeah. So you view them the same like they do particularly like models for the state Canada. Uh huh. Wait, it's, it's, it's one more thing. It's, not, uh, it's hard to hear with the past. I, just, I, I think I think of it as. Them looking at people the same way, looking at ordinary people the same way, you can see all of them in the back houses, right. and kind of saying we're all the same in some ways, maybe. Mm, interesting. Yeah, yeah. One, and, one, one, one is a bit different way. And, and yet, they, you know, like when we look at them, we say, well, they're not the same, you know, but yes, they, he is treating them very much the same. Um, and, and I think this conversation about it is what makes me excited about looking at photographs. Um, anyway, so, so, so I think what else to description? Okay. <laughs> Looking at some of my notes here. Um, so the other, the, like I said before, the other way of getting access to images is to know a little bit more of the backstory kind of, you know, looking under the hood and seeing what is making this tick its history, it's, it's style. Um, it's, it's the way Avedon treats his images, I, his people here. Actually, he treated them all very nicely. I hear he was very uh, friendly, would chat and, and, and talk constantly with his, his, the people who were posing for him. Meanwhile, he had his uh, shutter release cable as he's talking and talking and he would you know shoot when he was sure he got what he wanted. Um, by using the white seamless backdrop, we're taking these people out of their element, right? So the people who work in the coal mines, we don't see the coal mine. We only see these dirty bodies. Um, <clears throat> uh, and, and we expect that from models because we think, well, it's about fashion, it's about commerce, but what happens when we do this to people, taking them out of where they belong? So a fascinating book is um, uh, Avedon at Work, and you see the process of Avedon uh, photographing his American West series. And these are, you know, up here he is, uh, here's his backdrop. He would sometimes just tape it up to a wall 
it seems that he used available light in most of these, if not all, maybe he used some bounce, I'm not sure, um, or fill light. That's what this appears to be, but I actually can't see what they're photographing. Um, uh, but knowing this gave me a lot more to go by uh, when looking at Avedon's work. Am I almost out of time? You're doing fine. Okay. <laughs> I'll talk until you can't stand it anymore. <laughs> uh, and uh, you probably have all seen this image here of the uh, beekeeper. But to me, seeing the bees and Avedon actually kind of sculpting. Now, what I heard was that Avedon was putting some something like either not a pheromone, but something that would attract the bees to a certain part of the man's face. And uh, because he was curating this, this photograph, he was, he was the stylist, the stylist of bees. And of course, you know, this is a stunning image. We don't see the beekeeper in his environment either. We see him on the white backdrop and that makes it more startling. And thank you for coming, you guys. It was really, really good to see you. Jill, I'll, I'll see you guys on Monday. <laughs> All right, from here, I'm going to ramble a little bit more because the next thing that I want to talk about is photography as art. And often, um, when you go, when I go to museums, I see photography as art, and art is so much. It's conceptual, it's, uh, it, it can be for commerce, it can be for snapshots, it can be for science. Photography is so many things. And knowing what each photograph is for is our way of getting into it. And that, of course, this is uh, Zanelli Muholi. Uh, they are a South African uh, artist, visual activist. Um, so for, uh, well, for, many years, they have documented Black, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and intersex people's lives in various townships in South Africa. That gives us one way of entering this, right? Suddenly we know about a little bit about this image. Maybe not a lot. I still don't know a lot about it, but uh, I, I'm entranced by it. This right here is Zanelli Muholi. Uh, this that and there's a whole series of these self-portraits. What are some of the notable things about this? Uh, well, let's go to the next two, just so because there's more to go by. What are some of the notable things about these portraits? Props. Props, yeah. What are those props? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, I mean, the hat, it's not a hat, but it's, it's, a, it's cool, yeah. All of them kind of out of place, for the most part. Right, the props are kind of out of place, and what do you mean by out of place? Because that's interesting. It's a, it's a school product, hat. It's, that's not what you're supposed to have your, your um, respirator with your, your like, out on your head. Right, right, right. right. Right, so by putting a, uh, a stool on your head, you're calling it a hat. Exactly, it can be whatever you want it to be. Something else that's notable about this is that the skin is very dark. And what they have done is darkened their skin. In, uh, and I think that some of this is done in Photoshop. I doubt that um, they are in blackface because they don't need that, but I think it's in Photoshop. By intensifying the blackness, they're talking about blackness and shades of blackness and the beauty in blackness and putting this kind of in your face. Um, the eyes are also lightened. Uh, I'm sorry, but I, I walked away from uh, the computer and sorry if you couldn't hear me. Um, 
And I'm actually not keeping track of the chat, but uh, I, I do see that there are some comments in here. Um, so in this conversation, here's another two that I think are just absolutely remarkable. Um, uh, and and it, okay, just one more thing uh, that uh, they are, they work in activism in South Africa and to be transgender, uh, to be in the LGBTQ community is a lot more dangerous. The stakes are higher there than they are here. And so uh, the kind of courage that it takes to do this and then come out with courageous work like this. It's just, to me, it's, it's pretty astounding. Um, and you notice that these are objects that are just around the house. Now, um, I, I did show this right after Avedon's because the backdrops are pretty much plain. They're kind of studio backdrops, whether it's, I don't know exactly what that is, but they're plain mute backdrops. There's, there's no context there. Doesn't mean that they don't uh, photograph that way. And so there are some other conceptual, these are more activists, but um, uh, Hiroshi Sujimoto is a conceptual artist. Now this is the interior of a theater. Has, has, how many people have seen this work? Anybody? Yeah, okay, great, great, great. So this, tell me what is this about then? Yes, you, you I, I don't need to talk about it. You're watching a whole movie. Exactly. We're watching a whole movie. This is a long exposure. A movie played the whole time. And all we see is light. And obviously that's what's gonna happen. Now, the, the rest of the theater, of course, is, is illuminated and we can see it's a nice old theater. And this series goes on and on and on. He went to a lot of old theaters, some that were breaking down and others that were restored and um, made this about time. Photography is about light and time. Photography, like I said early on, it's about slicing a moment out of time and freezing it. Um, this is, is if it's a two hour movie, that means it's a two hour exposure. That's, that's freezing two hours in time. And then look what we're seeing. So it's, it, he's asking us to think. And that's what conceptual artists do. But that's why sometimes it's so hard to access. If you don't know, if you look at these, you, you might say, oh, that's pretty cool. It's a drive-in theater at night. We know it's a real long exposure because look at all those planes that went by, right? Um, uh, but the fact that it's a movie that we're watching and not seeing, it's so ethereal. Light is so ethereal. So are our photographs. They're kind of ethereal. We just happen to catch what it looks like. And I'm going to end up just with <laughs> some work that I saw just last weekend uh, in, in New York. I was at the Guggenheim uh, very briefly. Uh, and um, another artist who works conceptually is uh, Gillian Waring. I, I think it's Gillian, not Gillian, but I'm not sure. Any, if, if you know, let me know. I'll call her Gillian. <laughs> uh, Gillian Waring, uh, this, this exhibit at the Guggenheim was called Masks. And you might go in thinking, well, it's about the masks we wear during COVID. And, but it is not. Uh, in fact, I don't think she even addressed COVID in any of these, but she's always talked about masks. Um, this is a, a photograph of Gillian herself. And she went through these, this process that I can't really tell you how involved the process is, but taking old snapshots of, in this case, of herself at 17, creating a, um, a mask of her own face and I, somehow 
putting it onto a, a model. I think she had a model made from the snapshot. It's a very involved process. And then re photographs it. So you can see her 17 year old self with her older face. And in many cases, you can see where the eyes kind of don't quite match up. Um, and she did this with family members. She did this, oh, of course, this is a Gillian at three years old. And this is an image of her mother with her face on it. So all of these faces are her. And it's just kind of crazy and creepy. But you're supposed to think more deeply about it. Because if we were looking at photography as just uh, this craft to portray something beautiful, um, we, we'd be missing the point. There's so much more going on. And, and she takes things like snapshots and turns them inside out, uh, opens the top and just empties them out and says, what the heck, what, what can I do with these? Um, this exhibit that I saw was pretty amazing. If you're in New York, do go see it. Um, there, well, I'll, I'll go to the, the next slide, which is um, one, one room. All of these images that you see up here are actually screens, they're monitors. And these people are posed in snapshot poses, typical snapshot poses. But these are live, these are videos, they're not live, but they're videos. And it's a long video loop where these people are just sitting and sitting and sitting. So it's this snapshot that doesn't stop in a way. And you see them kind of like blink sometimes. Sometimes you'll see them maybe scratch a little bit or shift and it just keeps going. And so, as a conceptual artist, we're talking about that slice of time, but this slice of time doesn't stop. And of course, I'm fascinated with, with this. Um, uh, and, and like I said, it goes on and on there. It was a big show, uh, so you should go see it. Uh, you do see the curator's statements, uh, snapshot extends the process of historical recreation Wherein began in the family album, another series, uh, by reimagining old photographs as short looping films. Each of the seven videos in the work is set in a different decade of the 20th century and features a female subject of a different age. The viewers span from left to right. They witness a cycle of life as well as a condensed history of self presentation, and you, you get the rest. This is actually not where I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop this with my work <laughs> because when I, you know, going into photography as art, um, I teach photography. I have taught photography for many years and I teach people to go out and use their cameras and photograph. And it's something that I myself don't do. My students are better photographers than I am because they know how to go out and take pictures. And I am relegated to the studio. <laughs> I pretty much, that's where my photography takes place. So I'm okay with that. I really am. <laughs> but, um, uh, but this is another kind of artwork. And knowing that, knowing that I'm not that photographer, I, you know, I'm not the Bob George or anyone else who goes out and sees, I see other things. And of course, in this case, this was a, an extension cord. And some of you I'm sure saw this show, I don't know how many years ago at the Brattleboro Museum, um, but this was one of the big images. Um, Another thing that I have not shown around here is the, this series that I, I started out by just wringing my hands, taking these tight shots of me wringing my hands and stuff. And um, it also coincided with my outrage and the world's outrage at the Catholic Church um, uh, and, and the sex abuse scandals that have been ongoing for for knows how long. Uh, so, so that's why, you know, I, I make this stuff, I have these, this kind of uh, photographic skin. My 
work is about process. It's not about taking a picture and printing it. You know, I, I have to take it off the, bat, the, the, the substrate and put it on another substrate. And, and in this case, I cut out uh, images of crucifixes and put it behind and uh, made this kind of blurry look. Uh, another image that uh, I, I made from this in this series uh, was my hands. Uh, and where those crucifixes are on the fingertips, I actually sewed them right into the photograph. So that's actual thread. And, and this is a detailed view of it. So, um, and I'm not a sewer, but I did sew. You know, I, it's like, well, I figured if I just draw the line where the cross is supposed to be, I can, I can follow the lines. And I did, I did okay. Uh, but that was the same, and some of you, if you had seen my exhibit at the Brattleboro Museum, uh, that piece, the scarf, where I had knitted this long extension cord, um, once again, I didn't, I don't knit, I don't, didn't know how to knit, I had to go to YouTube to figure it out, but um, that's what, uh, that's what I did, because I needed to do it, so I, you know, I'm, I'm a photographer, and I'm not a photographer, uh, I'm a knitter, but I'm not really a knitter, you know. I can sew, but I don't really sew. So um, anyway, I, and, and I was going to line this up with something a little more dramatic, but it's left my mind. <laughs> <laughs> so I will stop here, and I'm I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, I'm sorry, I I can ramble, uh, and and there I was. Uh, Becky uh, says, Angelina Jolie recently posed for a similar image with bees by photographer Dan Winters. So referring to the Avedon uh, image with bees. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any thoughts, any just comments? It doesn't have to be a question because I might not have an answer. Yeah. Um, I have a friend from high school and he's an English major. His wife is an architect. He follows wherever her job takes, and he teaches English. So she went to Arizona, and he was teaching English in a jail, mm. a prison. Yeah. And he said they were the best students he ever had. And I wonder uh, what, how your experience there is. Yeah, good question. Um, uh... I teach in a jail, and um, now I, I have done some training at a, uh, a penitentiary outside of Philadelphia, um, where there are more lifers, and those pe that community is different than the community at the jails, which are there's a little short time. So without the commitment to time of, of actually living there, um, for much longer periods of time. The people who are there for shorter periods sometimes don't get as involved. But I, you know, I, I do wanna say, yes, I had some very good students uh, in, in the jail. I did have some that were just like typical students who blew stuff off and you know, didn't care to do the work. But <laughs> and, and Christina could, could uh, you probably remember some of them. Um, but yeah, but no, it, but it is fascinating. And, and it, to be able to have a class where they can only photograph in one room yeah. is uh, a real challenge to your creativity, which is why, you know, I, I talk, we taught them Photoshop skills. So they, if they needed a landscape that of course is not available to them, they would uh, photograph out of a magazine or a book and use that landscape. And, and, you know, with the process, uh, halftone dots and all. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I just wanted to share, um, Lorena on Zoom said a perfectly excellent ramble. You covered, <laughs> you, you, covered, you covered a great diversity of work and raised great questions to ask ourselves as we connect with the world through this medium and connect with ourselves and our inner world. And Becky says, do you sew, knit and stitch on paper? Um, can you talk more about this process so that you don't ruin the paper? Yes, with this one, I um, before before adhering it to the paper, I adhered this kind of uh, um, the, the skin, which is the photograph. I adhered that to fabric, 
And once that was all dry, I usually adhere things with um, acrylic gel, clear acrylic. And once it's all dry, then I can sew into that and the fabric will keep it from being destroyed. And then I kind of put it onto paper. In, in this case, I put it on paper. Yeah. So no, I did not sew through the paper. It was through this kind of, you know, the image and the fabric. You don't see the fabric, but what you do see here is since this is what's called a gel lift, um, uh, Chris Trebert and I talk, oh well, God, we talk process all the time. We love talking process. And Chris uh, told me about actually coating uh, a sheet of um, this plastic. I can't remember what plastic it is, but I coat that with acrylic gel. Then I coat it with um, uh, the inkjet coating. And once it's all dry, I put that right through my printer. And when that's dried and sprayed and fixed and everything, I can actually peel it off of the plastic. And so I have this kind of filminess, filmy image that I can then put down on other surfaces. And sometimes that filmy, plasticky thing uh, sort of puckers up and, and folds in on itself, which I'm delighted with. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that's what I did in, in this image. I, I actually made these lines mostly on the outside. I kind of smoothed it out on the inside where my hands were, but I, I made those lines. It reminded me of a cartoon, you know, when there's those lines when someone's moving. <laughs> that's what it reminded me of a little bit. But, uh, so that's, that's the process. It's uh, kind of in a nutshell. Any last questions or thoughts? Okay. Well, thank you guys. So Let much. you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you to our 30 something Zoom visitors. Um, and um, for all of you who are in person or online, um, we, of course, appreciate any donations that you're able to make at the box at the door um, to help continue these wonderful events. And hopefully, now that we've sort of broke the ice a little bit, we can do more um, uh, hybrid events or even possibly just entirely online events that would allow us to work with other artists um, from outside the region. Um, as delightful as it is to be in person, um, we could certainly expand our audience with Zoom shenanigans. I'm only sorry it took us this long to get here, but thank you guys so much and enjoy the rest of your eating. Please feel free to hang thank out. You, everyone. Thanks I'll so much. turn the lights back on and thank you so much. <laughs>